turn in your hymnals to page 76, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go, verses 1, 2, and 4, page 76. into your hymnals to page 265, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, page 265.
Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here to your house of worship on this beautiful morning. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. And Lord, we are here gathered in your name, so we know that you're here among us. So we ask you to bless this hour of worship, Lord, and we pray that it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Blessed Sabbath day to you. Good morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Oh, I want to see joy and smiles on your faces. Even though it's raining outside, the love of God should be in your heart. Amen? Amen. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us today at the Chula Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church. Members and guests, we give you a hearty, warm welcome. And thank you for coming into God's house today. I pray that you will be blessed. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in Matthew 13, verse 23. Matthew 13, 23. And the word of God says, But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Amen. So 
you do for us. Thank you for the rain that we have, that the water of the earth that we need. Thank you for so many things that we just can't even begin to express them. But most of all, thank you for Christ and for what he has done for each one of us. We want to ask you for some special blessings today. We ask that you be with the upcoming evangelism campaign in in March that will have many souls brought to the foot of the cross and to understand more about you. We want to have a special blessing brought upon our speakers today, Pastor and Christine. And continue to bless Christine and Elisa and their outreach program to this community. Be with them and keep them safe. We have some burdens on our heart today also, Lord. Especially we want to remember in prayer uh, Matilda Shagnon, my wife's sister that's in the hospital. Lori uh, with edema. Katie with Parkinson's. And John as he returns to Christ. And I know that there are others, people that are missing today for whatever reason, people that are suffering. We want to remember them as well, Lord. You know their their needs better than we do. And all those on the the prayer list that we have, like at our Wednesday night prayer meeting and the other prayer groups that that are meeting, remember them as well, Lord, and meet their needs as you see best. May it be your will, not ours. And now, Lord, we want to thank you for being a loving, listening, living Heavenly Father. May we all be ready to go home with you and you come. In Jesus' name, amen. Now time for our lamb's offering. If we can have those in the audience to raise those dollar bills so that the young people can come and collect them from you. Do we have any children with us today? Or are we going to just have big children? I'll tell the story to you. We're all God's children. Wave that money high. The children have need of your donations to continue their work. I'm so 
supposed to do that. <laughs> Here's a cute little guy right here that has nothing in his hand. And I'm going to take that little one home with me, so his mother better be careful. Gabriel. He's too cute. Thank you. Come and have a seat. Right here, sweetie. More. Thank you. Good job. I think there's, is there any more out there? Look around. He said he only had one. Oh. Thank you. Come on over here and have a seat. Have a seat right there. Honey, come on this side. Here we go. Good job. Yeah, I'll take that one too. All right. Can you come over here and have a seat? Oh, we have more coming. Keep playing, Cindy. No, oh, it's not Cindy. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You in the black hoodie. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to see you today. How many of you enjoy Sabbath school? How many of you enjoy listening to the stories at Sabbath school? Yeah, I got my big kids over here, yay. <laughs> I want to tell you a story, and it comes from the Old Testament, and it's in Second Chronicles. And basically, my boys, young boys are probably like, do you like armies? Do you like army men? And tanks, and I know. Yeah, boys use interest in those kind of things. In Second Chronicles, there was the children of Israel, and they had many enemies, and the enemies were always trying to come after them. And one time there was an army of enemies waiting to get the children of Israel and they were so fearful that they cried out to God for help. And God told them, he sent message by one messenger and he said in 2 Chronicles 20, 15, he says, do not be afraid, don't be dismayed because the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. And I remember that story from church. Because one day, as a little girl, I was walking to school, and all of a sudden, there were like four or five other larger kids that wanted to have trouble with me. And I was a good girl, so I didn't start anything. But they came closer and closer, and they were going to really cause me some harm. And I remembered this story, and I prayed to God. It's like, God, help me. And the scripture came to my mind and said, don't be afraid. Do not be dismayed. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And before I knew it, right from around behind me, there was a big arm that came and put its arm around me. And then I could see the faces of those children that wanted to harm me, and they just kind of stood there and stared. And then they just turned around and walked away. And then I turned around to see who was next to me, and it was a girl that lived in my neighborhood. She was really big and kind of heavy. No one liked her, but I always said hi to her. I was very nice to her. She didn't have any friends, but she came and stood by me that day and protected me from those bullies. So you know that when you're in trouble, when you have any fear, any doubt, any discouragement, anything that seems like a battle, I want you to remember that God says the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's, and he will send rescue. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Who would like to pray with us this morning? This young lady is always a good volunteer. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for everyone in this world, and thank you for every kind of speech, and thank you for the peace pillars that are here. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, boys and girls, and you have a good day. And remember to listen to your stories in church. They'll be valuable when you get older. Amen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good.
for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, to him who by wisdom made the heavens, to him who laid out the earth above, I'll give thanks unto the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. He gives us so many things to give thanks for and to count our blessings. And one of the blessings that we have is to bring our tithes and our offerings into his house. Our offering today is for our church budget. And this church has such a wonderful ministry, such a wonderful outreach. Let's support it in every way that we can. This year is going to be a great year for evangelism. Lord willing, many souls will be won for him. And we need to support it, not just with our minds and our prayers, but also with our finances. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you again for all that you do for us. Thank you for each person here, for the funds that will be returned to you to continue your work here in this church and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our special music this morning is going to be brought to us by Stephanie Mayung. May God bless her ministry. Think of other countries where past and present where God was something to be feared and you had to sacrifice in order to appease them and if they felt like it they you know would, would not be kind and you know they fight with each other those are the gods that people other people have grown up with but you know our God is just an extremely loving God all he does is live you know and breathe and love us and um you know, how fortunate are we? Amen. So this song today is, uh, we don't worship God because of what he does for us, but because of who he is. Voice my praise because of who you 
Stephanie, what a blessing to have you as part of our church. Thank you so much. Already begun our worship through that song. This morning, um, I'd just like to uh, have you look at your bulletin and notice that next Sabbath we have a special speaker who is going to be here. He's going to be uh, ad addressing a very interesting ministry that he has reaching out to communist nations. Uh, North Korea, China, on and on. Very interesting how this uh, gentleman has gotten involved in this ministry. Very interesting how they, they try to uh, get the gospel, gospel to North Korea, for example. They send up balloons with literature, and they float across the border and come down over there somewhere. If they're anything like the balloon my son sent up this last summer, they go up so you know to eighty some thousand feet. They, the balloon bursts and then the literature comes flying down. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I guess it must be effective. And um, so be here; you're going to be blessed. Um, let's see. I have two other brief announcements. Good news: a donation was made that uh, is directed toward redoing our pews. Amen. How would you like to have more comfortable pews to sit on? Amen. Now be honest. Be really blunt right now as I ask you this question. Because see, I don't, I don't sit out there. I don't know what it's like. So tell me, is it uncomfortable? Yes. <laughs> really? It is? Okay, well... Hallelujah. It's new carpet, new pews. Good news, we're going to be meeting this Monday to start that process of uh, picking. And uh, believe me, I will have nothing to do with colors. I don't know anything about picking colors. I, I made a big mistake in another church. I picked, just picked the grout color for the men's room. And, after, after it was, and I put the grout in and after, you know, between the tile. And after it was done, he was so ugly. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, there you go. And uh, there's some talk maybe of uh, putting tile in the, in the, uh, in the um, women's room and maybe the men's room too. I don't know where that'll go. But anyway, those are some of the ideas. All right, we have a problem in this church. We have a big problem. We have so many people that want to talk about opportunities for you to witness we just don't even have time for them from Sabbath to Sabbath. Amen. So Justin, come on up here. I, I didn't let James talk last Sabbath because I figured we were going to run out of time. Where is Justin? Actually, it's going to be Sam. Oh, it's going to be Sam. Yes. Sam. I'm so sorry, Sam. You gave such good <coughs> testimonies last night. Come on up here and give us your testimony of what, what Glow's doing. Use the mic here, though. Do you know what you're doing? Well, one second, one second. Okay, all right. All right, we'll go on with the sermon while these guys confer. We have fun in this church, okay? Hope you don't mind, you know. All right, they're both coming up. Okay. I apologize. Yes. I, I've been hounding the pastor every week to do a glow testimony because, you know what, it's on my heart to really carry this ministry forward. And um, last week, it didn't happen, and I didn't get mad at him, right? I didn't get mad at you? Okay. This week, I asked him, and he's like, I just can't do it. And I was like, Pastor, I need to do a glow testimony. But then, you know, I, I understand we, ha we have a packed schedule, so um, I elected not to do it at the last minute. I didn't let you know. And then Earl is supposed to do it, but um, anyways, Earl, if you'd like to do the testimony, please come up and share it at this time. So thank you. You not all In this church, you get three sermons today. Morning. Morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So this week's email comes from Southern, Southern California Globe Program. And it says, last week, I picked up my phone to return Mark's call. He had left a message in our Glow answering machine. And Mark is a Christian who is in love with God very much. He was really impressed with our glow tracks and wanted more so he could 
as he put it, campaign for God. I asked Mark how he came across one of the glow tracks, and he said he got it from a friendly person at an Adventist event. He's not an Adventist, <clears throat> but the track he received was on the second coming of Jesus. Mark, Mark was touched by this track and wanted to share it so much that he went to Kinko's and blew it up and put it on his truck. I suppose that's another creative way to hand out glow. You don't have to take your glow to Kinko's, but let's continue to hand out our tracks. Amen. There are so many people out there who will be extremely touched. I could tell that Mark was crying on the other side of the phone while we prayed before we hung up. Mm. He expressed to me how deeply he was moved after reading the glow track. I pray that this story encourages us to continue to hand out literature. Amen. Also, please don't forget, instead of having our Glow Outreach on the last Sabbath of this month, we will be doing it in conjunction with our Bible workers tomorrow. So please be there. Thank you. Amen. It's been a lot of fun just being a part of a church that is so active and has so much fun together. So. Just for Melissa and I, we're really glad to be here, very thankful, and um, it's been definitely been a blessing, and will continue to be. <laughs> I know that our scripture reading today started off with Matthew 13, verse 23, but to begin, I would like to start with Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Um, a couple weeks ago, Mike Tuazon was here, and he shared a little bit about this parable, which actually happens to be one of my favorites. And um, he mentioned during his sermon that there are actually two applications to this parable, but he only touched on one. And uh, I really like touching on the other one as well, so I'd like to focus on that today. As you're finding your places, I'm just going to go ahead and say a word of prayer that God's Spirit will be with us. Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for the Sabbath. I know when I was little, I didn't appreciate it like I do now, Lord. And I think all of us here have experienced that. We need that rest with you. We need that time with you. And Lord, I'm, thank you that you, I'm so thankful that you provided for that today. I ask that as we dig into your word, Lord, that you will send your spirit to guide our minds, Lord. You promised that he would guide us into all truth. And I pray that you will help us to see parables that we've heard before, things that we've heard before in a new light, Lord or that it will make a deeper impression on our lives today and stay with us. Thank you, Lord, for being with us and for, for guiding our words, our ears, and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found, and with joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In this parable, a man stumbles across a large sum of money. In those days, people didn't have banks where they could hide their assets like we do today. So anything of value, they hid beneath the earth. Whoever owned the land, also had the title to whatever hidden treasure might be underneath. And one, man, one day as a man was going through, he noticed something different. And uh, underneath the earth, he uncovered something of great value. Knowing this, he went and sold everything that he had so he could buy that field and the treasure in it. Going on, Jesus explains about a merchantman who was seeking after a beautiful pearl. The Bible doesn't say how long he had been searching. Maybe it had been for years. But he knew that somewhere out there was that pearl. I just kind of imagine it as, have, have any of you been to a swap meet or, what do you call them, flea markets, anything like that? Okay. There's all, you always find random things there. And sometimes there's things of no value, and sometimes there's amazing treasures hidden in there. And when I think of this parable, I almost imagine this man going through a little flea market looking at every corner, seeing if he can find that pearl of great price. 
and one day he finds it. Perhaps it's a little dusty. Maybe it has oil marks from all the times people have picked it up and put it back down. But underneath the dust and the oil, this man recognizes that pearl of great price. So much so that he gives everything that he has to buy it. When Mike spoke, he brought out how oftentimes when we look at this parable, it teaches us how we need to give up everything for heaven, how we need to be willing to lay down our lives and give up everything for Christ. And that's true. Amen. But there's another application to this parable. The first time I heard it, it made a deep impression on my life, and I pray that it will be a big blessing to you as well. In Christ's Object Lessons, we read, The parable of the merchantman seeking goodly pearls has a double significance. It applies not only to men as seeking the kingdom of heaven, but to Christ as seeking his lost inheritance. Christ, the heavenly merchantman seeking goodly pearls, saw in lost humanity the pearl of price. In man, defiled and ruined by sin, he saw the possibilities of redemption. God looked upon humanity not as vile and worthless. He looked upon it in Christ and saw it as it might become through his redeeming love. This parable tells us about who Jesus is, about how he laid down everything for you and me, for those that are not even in this church right now, for our friends, our family, the strangers that we see every day, going to work, going to school. According to inspiration, and according to the Bible, most importantly, as we will see in just a minute, humanity is that pearl of great price. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 19, verse 5. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. All right. The Bible says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. God tells us here that we're his special treasure. When we follow him, when we accept the sacrifice that God has given for us, it brings so much value. When he looks down at us, he sees gold in every single individual. Turn with me again to Psalms 135 and verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. We know today that we're spiritual Israel. Back in the day, God had a group of people who were to take the knowledge of him to those who didn't have that opportunity. It was the Israelites. They were to spread, spread the good news of their God to the surrounding nations. And as Christians, we're given that same commission today to spread what we have and share it with others. And God calls us a special treasure. He says that he's chosen Israel as his special treasure. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, we see this picture expounded upon as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. In this, in this passage, Paul is speaking to the believers in Thessalonica, and he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Speaking to the people, Paul reiterates the thought, God's thoughts in the Old Testament, where he says, You are the, our crown of rejoicing. You are our joy. You are our treasure. And finally, in Malachi 3, verse 17, 
right at the very end of the Old Testament. I'll begin in verse 16. God says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. We see in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that God com continues to reiterate that idea that we're his treasure, we're his crown of rejoicing, we're a peculiar people. We are something special in his eyes. Humanity, who has fallen so far, could have, that much, could have that much value. It's a thought that blows my mind. But it's a blessing. There's another verse in the Bible that talks about a treasure. It's one that we grow up hearing a lot when we're kids, learning a lot about when we're kids. And um, it's in Matthew 6 verses 19 through 21. A few years ago, even last year, I would read this, this passage, and then I would read Matthew 13, and I never made any connection between them. They were two different ideas to me. But last year, doing, during another um, practicum that we have at Souls, at the school I'm currently attending, God really showed me something deeper and it, it left that deep impression on my, my heart, and I really just pray that you'll be able to see it and be, best, be blessed by it as well. But in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here Jesus challenges us to store up not earthly wealth, but heavenly wealth. As I was thinking about this passage, the question went through my mind, well, what does heavenly wealth look like? It's easy to think about wealth in the terms of money or in the kinds of things that we own. But there's a bigger wealth than that. I've heard growing up that there's two things that we take to heaven. First, it's our character. Secondly, it's the souls that, we, that God uses us to bring to his kingdom. When I thought of that, lining up Matthew 6 with Matthew 13, I realized that Jesus is talking about people. He doesn't want us to focus on the here and now, on how much, how much money we can earn at work or how much knowledge we could get at school, but he wants us to focus on the people around us. Verse 21 really hit me. It says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever we put our value, that's where our heart is. And then I thought about it. All of these verses in Psalms, in Malachi, where God reveals to us that we're his treasure, if we're God's treasure, then where does that place his heart? On us. God's heart is with his people. His heart is out there for you and me. That's where his focus is. In Matthew 22, Jesus says, Says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy, mi with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This morning, as you're sitting here in church, I challenge you just to look around, not just a glance, but really look at who's sitting next to you, who's sitting across from you. Every single person is a treasure in God's eyes. Amen. Then think of the people that aren't here with us today. Think of those that are back home or maybe in another country. Maybe they don't know God. There's still a treasure in God's eyes. 
Yes, God recognizes our condition as fallen human beings. He knows that we're covered with dirt, that our lives aren't perfect, that they're not stainless. But he doesn't look at us and see us for all the problems. He sees us for what we can become through Christ. He puts so much value on each person that he was willing to give everything, even his only begotten son, to die in our place, that we could have that chance of being in heaven with him. God looked upon humanity not as vile and worthless. He looked upon it in Christ and saw it as it might become through his redeeming love. Will we choose to treasure the same thing that God treasures? Will we choose to look at those around us the same way that God looks at them? As we consider the treasure that people are to us, we look beyond here. We look beyond the walls of this church and the membership role that we have here and the guest list. We look beyond and we see our community, our neighborhood. These people are precious to us. They're precious to God. Therefore, they should be precious to us. And the question is, what that I want to look at just now is, what is the gospel seed that we are to sow in their lives? What is it that they need to hear from us? If we look at Revelation, probably my favorite passage in the Bible, Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> it's one of my favorites anyway. Chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Revelation chapter 14, 6 and 7. <clears throat> having the everlasting gospel. It's interesting how he adds that word, the everlasting. In other words, this gospel has been around a long, long time, folks. The everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water and what I want to share with you this morning is the difference between the gospel that the Seventh-day Adventist Church and our Bible workers and our pastors and teachers should be conveying to our students whether Bible students or students in school or or wherever wherever we're preaching this message the underlying, the very basis of everything we do is our understanding of the everlasting gospel. What is that gospel? Well, let me see here. Let's get this thing moving along. <clears throat> if you look at a typical gospel presentation by an evangelical group such as Campus Crusade for Christ, there's four points that they have. <clears throat> God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. Unfortunately, though, we're sinners. <clears throat> we're separated from God, and therefore we cannot know and experience this plan, the love of God and his plan for our lives. Number, point number three, and of course they have supporting scriptures. I've just summarized them here. You'll often find this in these little booklets that they hand out on campuses and, or, and anywhere they can. Number three, Jesus is God's only provision. There is no other way. Jesus is the only provision that God has made for the sin problem that we have, the separation from God. And through him, though, if we receive him, through him, you can know and experience God's love and his plan for your life. Notice the, the emphasis, sort of the target uh, theme that keeps recurring through these points is God's plan for your life. A good, a good theme. It is important to emphasize that God has a plan for your lives. Last night, the handout that you girls had, the very first Bible text was Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. 
God had a plan for Jeremiah. Before he was born, God had a plan. Amen. And he has a plan for you and I too. <clears throat> it's true. And through him you can know and experience God's plan and his love for, for you. Then point number four, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. It's not something we can do in a group. It's, uh, it's something that each one in their own heart has to do from their heart with their whole being. And then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <clears throat> Campus Crusade for Christ's gospel leaves something out and leaves someone out. <clears throat> you might be surprised by who uh, I'm going to name as that someone. You see, the good news of what God does concerns not only what he does about your sins, but about your adversary. And therefore, the gospel needs to go back and begin where the gospel began, and that is in the Garden of Eden when God announced his plan to save us from our sins. To go all the way back and deal with the fact that that adversary that, that man confronted in the garden, that Adam and Eve had met there <clears throat> and who, who defeated them, needs to be dealt with. That he's still after us. It says, that's the theme of Revelation 12, verse 10. He is our accuser. He's still after us. <clears throat> So, what does God do with Satan's opposition to your salvation? That's something that no other church really deals with. No other, there's no other doctrine of any other church that really deals with the fact that you have someone who is opposing your salvation from, from the day you're born, when you receive Christ, and after you receive Christ, and then... Well, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I go there. And so what does God do with Satan's opposition to your salvation? And what does God do with Satan himself? And when does he do it? The answer to both of these questions should be part of our gospel presentation. They should be the underlying theme of every Bible study that we give. Should be driving to, to one point in this unique Seventh-day Adventist doctrine called uh, the pre-advent judgment. And of course, all along the way, it needs to be Christ-centered. So what does God do with your, the opposition of Satan to your salvation? What does he do with him, he, uh, Satan himself? Well, let's take a look at this, these next slides, and this is toward a, a more complete gospel, okay? This is the way Seventh-day Adventists should present the gospel. This is what ought to underlie and inform every Bible study, I truly believe. Okay, so here's the gospel presentation that I would like to uh, suggest we give. Number one, yes, God loves you. He loves you. Christine was emphasizing that in what she presented. God sees you as a treasure. He loves you with all his heart. And through your parents, Adam and Eve, he offered you eternal life, unending life with him is what he originally offered to us. But then Satan snared mankind in Eden, and since that time, all have sinned and become separated from God. We hide from God, we hide from, really, from ourselves even, and from one another. Satan is determined to keep you apart from God. He is your adversary, he's your enemy, he's your persecutor, and he's bent on your destruction. But, hallelujah, point number three. Jesus Christ is God's provision. It's his only provision, but it's his provision for this problem we have with sin. Through him you can know and experience God's love and escape Satan's grasp on you. Satan does have a grasp on you. I mean, just think about it. Someone receives Christ, 
And it's not too long before they realize that Satan's still there. Amen? Okay, so point number four. You must individually, without reservation, thank you, receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to be restored to God. At this point, it would be a good time to ask the one you're studying with, the one you're presenting the gospel to, <clears throat> would you like to give your sins to Jesus? I'm asking you right now. I want you to be the one sitting opposite me in your home, <clears throat> sitting on your couch, and I'm sitting there in a chair. We're looking at each other, and we're studying God's Word together. And I'm not just presenting these points, but I'm actually giving, showing you in Scripture where these things are so. So, I'm asking you now, would you like to give Christ your sins, your sinful life? Yeah. Would you like him to take them all away? You know, when he does that, he wants to throw them behind his back and never even think about them again. Would you like him to do that? You have to, never have to worry that, you know, he's up there remembering what you did. You know, some people say, yeah, I forgive you. But in the back of their mind, you know, they're keeping a record. <laughs> we shouldn't treat each other like that. Be more like the Lord. Would you like to commit your whole life to Christ as Lord? That, this means, would you like to turn your life over to him to be the master, to be the the, uh, the guide to be the captain of your soul. Amen. Would you like to do that? Amen. All right. <clears throat> and would you like to follow Christ in baptism? He was baptized in his example to you and me. Have you been baptized? No, you haven't? We're pretending <laughs> at this point. So you haven't been baptized. Would you like to be baptized? Help me out here. Play along. Okay. Right then, why don't we bow our heads right now? And why don't you tell this to God? And I'll help you. I'll lead you. I'll help you. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what to say, okay? All right. So let's bow our heads. Please, really. Bow your heads and repeat after me. Dear Father in heaven, this morning I want to give you all my sins. Please forgive me. And thank you for doing it. Lord, I, I want to commit my whole life to you. Nothing held back. I want you to be the captain of my soul. my Lord, as well as my Savior. And Father, as soon as possible, I would like to be baptized. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, once you've received Christ, as you have just done, you have peace with God. peace. When you receive Christ, you have freedom, joy. I'll never forget when it happened to me. How about you? When you were, the day you were baptized, <clears throat> when you made that decision, didn't you really feel good? I know sometimes people say, well, you can't count on feelings, but a lot of times people do feel really light, you know, like Cloud nine, it's just, it's a joyous day in their lives. How about you? Was that for you? Amen. <clears throat> it was for me. I was almost in a daze. I was so happy. You couldn't shut me up. I wanted to tell people about Jesus. I saw my mother in the store, my mother uh, who wasn't a believer and didn't like to hear anything about God. And there she was in the line there in Montclair store in uh, Oakland, Montclair District in Oakland, and I, I just happened to go into the store, and there she was. We didn't, I didn't live at home. And uh, 
oh, hi, Mom, you know, oh, hi, Brad, you know. Anyway, we got to talking, and I started witnessing to her. I just walked right up to her there. She's at checkout, you know. <laughs> Boy, was she uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, man, poor Mom. <clears throat> you know what's interesting about that? I was walking down the street, uh, the opposite side from where the store is. This is just a little community in Oakland. And um, the Lord told me, go to the store. I didn't know why, but I went over there, and as soon as I got in the door, there was Mom at checkout. <laughs> anyway, I know the Lord wanted me to do that, but uh, you know what I'm saying? I was just so full of happiness and joy, and my mom was telling people, I heard later, she was t telling people, I've never seen my son so happy. Amen. And so you have peace with God. It's wonderful, amen? amen. But you still have someone who is seeking your destruction. You may have peace with God, but you don't have with your, peace with your adversary. For the rest, this is what you need to know. Now remember, you're in your living room and I'm sharing the gospel with you. For the rest of your Christian life, he's going to be after you. He's going to put you through tests and he's going to put you through trials. A lot of people, you know, they receive Christ and, the, and life gets worse afterwards than it was before. And I just need you to know why this is, what's going on. It's because your adversary is, is troubling you and trying you. And he's trying to get you to give up your faith. He's trying to show that you really don't love God. That you're, not, that you're really not a loyal subject. That he's not really the captain of your soul. He's not the one that's really in charge. He's trying to show that you're still hanging on to the control levers of your life. I just need you to know that because to be forewarned is to be... You don't know that saying? To be forewarned is to be... To be say it with me. To be forewarned... Let me just repeat it after me, I should say. To be, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Be forearmed. All right. He's trying to ruin you, and he will keep doing so. So, you need to understand what God... That's not right. <laughs> what God does with Satan's opposition to your salvation. And what's the answer? It's written right on the screen. He silences him. And what do, does God do with Satan himself? He silences him. The same, same answer for both. How does he do it? When does he do it? Let's talk about that. God silences Satan in a judgment God's, the answer to both those questions is he silences them and he does it in a, in a time of judgment. We're in that time of judgment right now. This is the next thing I need you to understand about the gospel, the good news, is that there is a judgment that's going on before Christ comes again. Jesus silences Satan's opposition to your salvation by showing that you have put all your hope and faith in his mercy. As when my name comes up, when your name comes up in the judgment, Jesus is going to say, she, he, whatever your name is, can I pick on you, Simeon? All right. You're going to be saved in the end here, so don't worry. <laughs> That's the end of the story. It's a good ending to the story. <laughs> Jesus says to Satan, I have it right here in the records. You've made all your accusations, but Simeon, he's put all his hope, he's put all his faith in my mercy. He loves me, and he's counting on me to save him. And then he says, you know, he has repented, he has confessed every sin, and he's repented of every sin that I've shown him. 
You've troubled, you've tried him, and he's seen where he needs to grow, and he's grown in grace. And not only so, but every time you brought affliction into his life, he didn't give up on me. He hung on. You were not able to discourage him by all the things you did to him. He still loves me. He's counting on me to save him. And so I'm going to do it, and I want you to shut up. Amen. And you know, when, when Jesus says to, the, to Satan, be silent, what does Satan do? What did he say when he, he turned to the waves? You know, the, the, the waves were going this way, and the wind was blowing, and, and he said, what? Be still. be still. Be silent. Be still. And it just kept on going, right? No. no. Instantly. Just, just that fast. It was like glass. It was a sea of glass. The wind died down. When Jesus tells Satan to be silent, the opposition is over. And so... The way God deals with this one who is opposing your salvation is to silence him, and he does it in this merciful pre-advent judgment. It's part of the good news, folks. It's right there. The everlasting gospel in Revelation chapter 14, it shows us that the gospel includes judgment. If I am not sharing the doctrine of judgment with people as we study the Bible, if I am not doing that, I am not giving them the gospel. And if I am not doing it in, the, in a biblical way, as I have presented it here this morning, although I haven't used all the supporting texts that I normally would use, nevertheless, if I'm not sharing that with people, I'm not giving them the whole story and I'm not giving them what they need for the last days. Come back to that. Now, what does God do with Satan himself? His, he silences his lying, deceiving, malicious voice forever. Now, he silences them, each one individually, case by case, as your name comes up and my name comes up, because we put all our hope and trust in Christ. He silences him for each one of us. But one day he's going to end it all and forever silence that wicked voice. When finally, Romans chapter 14, verse 10, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When does that happen? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that what? Please notice these words. That everyone may what? Receive. When do you receive the things done in this body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad? When does the reception really happen? Does it happen at the second coming? No. I, praise God, there's some out, here, out there who are saying no. That's right. We don't receive the, the reward. We don't receive what he wants to give us when Christ comes again. Because what he wants to give, what does he want to give us? He wants to give us a restored earth. He wants to bring us back down here and recreate what he created in the beginning and give it back to us. A new head to the race, even Christ. But he wants to give us all that, that the beauty and the wonder of his original creation. He wants to give it back to us. That's when we receive that's when we receive. At the end of the thousand years, that's when we receive what God wants to give. But then also, you see, all stand before him. Not just you and I. Not just you and I and all lost humanity. But Satan himself stands before the judgment seat of Christ at that time. That's when these verses are ultimately fulfilled. When he will receive in his body the things that he hath done, whether good or bad, when he receives the reward, when he receives the penalty in his case.
You know, there was an amazing incident this week. Some of you haven't heard about this, I just found out. <clears throat> I think most of you have. Ship over in the Mediterranean. Let's see, the Costa, Costa, what is it called? Concordia. Did somebody say it? Costa Concordia? What, what am I hearing? Yeah, Costa Concordia. Uh, the captain of the ship wanted to impress some of the people on the shore, and so he steered the ship over, you know, nearer to the shore. When Becky and I went on a trip up to Canada, and the, the captain of that ship pulled it really close to the glacier so that you could see, you know, get a really good view. I mean, we were really close, and you could... Boy, I'll tell you, when the ice came down, you know, it was like a little, what was it, like thunder, Becky? Yeah, it was like thunder, I think. White thunder, yeah. Man, it was impressive. But you know what? He got a lot closer than the other ships. Well, this captain did something similar, but he got too close. And uh, he went aground, and eventually the ship ends up like you see it there on the screen, over on its side. Well, the captain gets arrested because uh, whether it's true or not, you know, we don't know. There's one person that thinks that maybe he's being accused or treated too harshly. But most captains, most people that know the story say that what he did is uh, he, he and his crew were the first ones into the lifeboats and, you know, you guys can do whatever you want, you know. I'm getting out of here. My, my, my. What a shame. You know, when God looks down from heaven, when God looks down from heaven, he looks at us like that captain. You know, what he should have done was to, to be concerned about those that were left on board, right? That should have been his concern. And, he, you know, he left them behind. He, was, he wanted to save himself. And he wasn't, you know, concerned about saving them. How about us? You know, we have a similar responsibility. God looks us at us with a similar responsibility, you know, with having a similar responsibility. We're not just here to save ourselves. You know... Christianity is not coming to a building and sitting in a church and listening to a sermon or two or 50-some sermons a year. Christianity is joining an army. It's, it's, it's joining a team. It's, it's, it's joining a missionary band. It's, it's going out to foreign lands. It's giving Bible studies. It's sharing Christ. Amen? Amen. Through pathfinders through evangelistic series, in Sabbath schools, in, our, in our, our, our school, SDA, San Diego Academy. That's what it's about. It's about being involved in, the, in his work. And by the way, I should say, don't, I hope you don't feel beat up upon right now. This church is marvelous. Amen. This church is wonderful in its... It's commitment to reaching out. But if you're sitting here and you're not involved, I want to appeal to you to, uh, to get involved in some way. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that this afternoon and tomorrow. I'd like Christine to come up and tell you a little bit more about how you can indicate your willingness to be involved. In a moment... You'll be receiving a paper that says church member information form. And on this form, all you need to do is just fill out your name, your address, your phone number, your email. Let us know if you've ever given Bible studies before or if you'd like to learn how to give Bible studies. You'll also see a listing here on the bottom where it says morning, afternoon, and evening, and it gives you each day of the week. Please, just put what times you're available. Alyssa and I would love to get you involved as well to help out with passing out flyers 
or even doing maybe just praying during that time. If you can do Bible studies, that would be amazing. Just let us know when you're, when you're available. When we're gone, we want to make sure that everyone that we've met has a connection here at church, that they have friendships, that the knowledge that they received about God's word will continue growing through the work that you're doing with them. Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches. All the nourishment that we have spiritually, all of our needs, they're provided through Christ. But when you look at grapes and the, a grapevine, the, bran the branches actually intermingle. They grow together as well. And as a church, God has us, asked us to look out for our brothers and sisters and to look out for those around us. This is one way that we can all be on the same page and reach out to one another. As you leave, we would like to collect these forms as well. Alyssa and I will stand in the back. Please hand them to us. And um, if you need pens or anything, I know there are a number that were passed out earlier. We do have a few extras, though. Just raise your hand, and I'll bring those to you as well. Thank you. So please fill these out and meditate upon uh, what you've heard this morning and your involvement as Alyssa sings. Mm -hmm. pray. Father in heaven, give us the heart and mind of Jesus. We thank you that, that you love us as you do. We praise you for your love. It is so wonderful and great. And do, Father, put that love in our hearts for others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.